Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Iron Africa with me, Georgia Cavan Smith. Tonight, dozens of sports fans are killed at a viewing hall in Nigeria's northeast. No one's yet claimed responsibility, but Boko Haram insurgents are suspected in their fears that they may be planning on exploiting the football season to target crowds. Also, Egypt's former president, Mohamed Morsi, who was ousted and arrested by the military in 2013, dies after collapsing in court. The country's first democratically elected leader's family had long complained about his prison conditions. And tensions have been high in Benin over the past week following clashes between protesters and police in the hometown of former leader Boni Yayi. Unrest has followed April's controversial parliamentary elections and Yayi's house arrest. But first, football fans in northeastern Nigeria were targeted in a triple suicide bomb attack on Sunday. 30 people were reportedly killed when the explosion went off outside a hall where people were watching a match in Kunduga in Borno State. No one's yet claimed responsibility, but there are suspicions that Boko Haram militants may be behind the violence. Sam Olakoya tells us more about the attack. Oh, most of those killed were youths, teenagers, uh, people in their very early teens and those who carried out these attacks were also youths, uh, a lady, two ladies, young ladies, and then a teenage uh, boy. Um, now, Nigeria is heading into a pretty busy football period. The Women's World Cup is on at the moment, and the African Cup of Nations kicks off this week as well. Is it at all likely that this will cause a particular security risk? Well, even the head of the relief agency was uh, definitely very worried when I spoke with him. And he said, uh, with what has happened, it seems uh, there's a deliberate attempt to target uh, people who are gathered in crowd, whether small or large. And I mean, with two uh, major football tournaments happening, the one in France, in which Nigeria is uh, participating, and then we also have uh, the African Cup of Nations, which you can call the African version of the World Cup, happening just uh, starting on Friday. You expect that you have lots of uh, young people going to some of these uh, football viewing centers. One of the problems is that uh, because people cannot watch these matches at home, they have to go. They have to go to these football viewing centers where they pay money and, and watch these matches, and that is why. Some of these places are normally very crowded. And this, this of course, is not the first we've seen of uh, football fans being, being targeted. We've, we had it before the last World Cup. A number of people were killed just before that World Cup as a football viewing centre. So it's definitely a threat. And, uh, I mean, apparently it's been done to coincide with the uh, football tournaments uh, going on in France and the African Cup of Nations coming up shortly. Sam Olakoya there for us. Now, former Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi collapsed and died in court on Monday. The 67-year-old reportedly fainted and passed away during his trial on espionage charges. Morsi became president in 2012 after the country's first and only free election. He was later forced from power in a coup in 2013 and arrested. He had a history of ill health and had been kept in solitary confinement for long stretches, sometimes up to 23 hours a day. Mohan Berstecker tells us more about the late leader. In June 2012, Mohamed Morsi became Egypt's first democratically elected president. A U.S. educated engineer, he had been a relative unknown before being chosen to represent the Muslim Brotherhood. And despite being the only candidate with an Islamist manifesto, Morsi had campaigned on a message of tolerance and inclusion trying to portray himself as a moderate. Today, I'm the president of all Egyptians, those who live here and those who live abroad. But the fall was as sudden as the rise for Mohamed Morsi, who soon began to display authoritarian tendencies. Months after his election, he issued a decree granting himself sweeping new powers and immunity from the courts, before pushing through a new Islamist constitution. These decisions proved unpopular with many Egyptians and sparked mass street protests in which dozens of people were killed, 
By June 2013, millions were in the streets to demand Morsi's departure. And in July, the army took things into its own hands, forcibly removing the president. The coup ended in a bloodbath, with the military, led by current president General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, violently repressing Morsi supporters in a crackdown that left nearly a thousand people dead. Morsi was arrested and later charged with inciting murder and torture, spying for foreign governments and plotting terrorist acts. He died aged 67, still in detention, after fainting during a court session. Protest leaders in Sudan have called on communities around the country to return to the streets in nighttime rallies in protest against their military rulers. Demonstrators say that at least 128 people have been killed since paramilitaries violently dispersed a sit-in in Khartoum on June 3rd. On Monday, the EU demanded a full investigation into that bloody crackdown. Critics of ruling generals are calling for the Transitional Military Council, which took over after President Omar Bashir was toppled back in April, to hand over to a civilian administration. Kenya's health minister said that the country is still free from Ebola as a sick woman who was suspected of having the disease was found not to have the virus. She'd reportedly shown some symptoms after returning from the border with Uganda. That sparked fears that an outbreak in DR Congo, in which 1,400 people have died since last August, may have spread. Last week, cases were found in Uganda where two people have died. And a Chadian rebel leader was arrested in France on Monday in connection to a Crimes Against Humanity investigation. General Mohamed Nouri heads the UFDD rebel group and launched a failed coup attempt against Chadian leader Idris Deby back in 2008. Now, he's been detained on suspicion of crimes that include genocide, allegedly committed in Chad and Sudan between 2005 and 2010. Well, tensions have been high in parts of Benin over the past week after clashes between protesters and police in the hometown of former leader Boniyai. Things have settled since the peak of the unrest, but several people were killed as part of demonstrations following controversial parliamentary elections back in April. Our team report from Chauru in the north of the country. Road traffic may be slowly getting back to normal, but security forces have kept their position along the main road. Over the last three days, a team of mediators made up of traditional leaders and local dignitaries have been trying to ease tensions caused when armed hunters, backed by locals, recently faced off against soldiers. They reassured us that the military will no longer walk around the village to shoot and scare the population. They asked us to call our brothers who left the village and who went to the surrounding villages to come back, to reassure them that calm has returned. Locals say that at least five people have been killed in Chauru since supporters of former president Thomas Boniyayi sparked the unrest about a week ago. These men show us the graves of four people who they say were gunned down. They were buried last Saturday. We were coming back from the field when I heard shots and we rushed to the houses. Some died on the spot. Outside of Chouru, the spray of bullet holes can be seen on the walls. This man says that armed forces opened fire on homes as they charged into the village last Friday. This 18-year-old was injured and had to be rushed to hospital. I came back home because I felt in danger. Armed men were roaming around the hospital. The clashes began last Tuesday after this woman's husband was arrested. He's accused of having triggered electoral violence during the 28th of April poll, allegedly to try and stop it going ahead because of the controversial absence of any opposition parties on the ballot. I don't know where my husband is. I'm worried because he had a road accident just before he was arrested and he was roughed up by the police. I can't sleep at night. We were able to meet a young opposition leader in Chauru. He's wanted by the police and has been in hiding for a month and a half. Commandos were sent to kidnap people, so the population rose up to say it's not going to happen. Several people were released from police custody over the weekend, and a precarious peace has returned to the city. 
Meanwhile, former President Thomas Boniyayi, the man suspected of being at the root of nationwide clashes that have followed the legislative election, remains under house arrest since early May. Protesters are threatening to return to the streets unless he's released. And Nigeria will have to wait and see if they qualify for the last 16 of the Women's World Cup after losing 1-0 against the hosts, France, in Rennes. It remained nil all until a VAR decision gave France a penalty. Wendy Renard hit the post but was retaken and scored because the Nigerian goalkeeper was off her line. Despite eight minutes of injury time, the Super Falcons failed to find an equaliser. They could still qualify for the last 16 as one of the strongest third-placed teams. So we wish them all the best of luck on that front. Well, that's it for Eye on Africa for now. Thanks very much for joining us. Do so again if you can. Take care.